In a couple of days, America will celebrate its birthday. A relatively young 247 years old. We celebrate freedom on July 4th each year. So knowing that, why on earth would we spend time today talking about the opposite of freedom? Slavery. Some people prefer not talking about or thinking about how the history of our country is entwined with slavery. That's all in the distant past, they say, while others can never forget what it meant and still means to them. The English word slave allegedly has its roots in the word slav, as in people from what we know as Slavic nations, who unfortunately being wedged between warring empires over centuries, often found themselves taken from their homes to serve others in foreign lands. The word doesn't make an appearance in the English language until 1290 AD or CE. But the history of slavery goes back much further. Ancient kingdoms and empires thrived on the labor of slaves. In those days, skin pigmentation did not determine who became slaves. Being on the losing side of battles had much more to do with it. The Bible is full of references to slaves, although many times the word is softened to servant. Just sounds better, right? But translators of Paul's letter to the Romans did not soften his use of the word slave, as we'll see in today's New Testament reading. From the apostles' point of view, every single human being from the time of the Garden of Eden through today have been slaves. Everyone, well, except one notable exception. That means you and I are slaves. Think about that while watching a fireworks display this week. But here's the thing. Ever since that one notable exception, each of us has had a choice of masters. So in today's service, we'll be challenging you to choose your master. You are not a captive audience, but we sure do hope you'll stick around. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, and welcome to the online worship service of Robins Memorial Presbyterian Church in Gastonia, North Carolina for Sunday, July 2nd, 2023. As we mentioned already, Tuesday is Independence Day, also known as the 4th of July holiday. We pray that you have a safe and happy day. Last week, we pointed out that the beginning of a new quarter, July, August, September, meant the newest edition of our devotional booklet, These Days Has Come Out. It is available here at the church. We also mailed out some copies to those we know can't make it here. If you fall in that category and would like a copy, let us know. Also from last week, you may recall we advised you today we'd have a big announcement. Don't want to keep you in suspense any longer than I have to. Okay, so here we go. The big announcement. Big Blue is back. 
Even though the school year seems like it just ended, a new one begins the middle of next month. That means it's time for the School Tools Challenge. Starting today and running through Sunday, August 6th, we will be collecting school supplies for Robinson Elementary School students. We don't have a formal list from them yet, but we know that there are certain things that are highly prized. Top of the list, by the way, boxes of facial tissue, Ziploc style bags, and then there's pencils, crayons, glue sticks, and markers. Apparently, not so much in demand nowadays is loose leafed ruled paper. Composition books are the in thing now. This is our fourth year in competition with some of our sister Presbyterian churches, and this year we've added two new competitors, Third Street and Long Creek. So, We've got more challengers to beat this time around. The big blue box will be stationed outside on the ramp from the parking lot to the office wing door 24-7 to take your donations. We'll also have a box in the narthex on Sundays. Let the competition begin and may the best church congregation, that is us win. Keep tuning in each week for updates. Now it's time to start this service with our responsive call to worship. Sing, sing of God's unalterable love. We will rejoice as we walk in the light of our God. Tell everyone around you of God's faithfulness. We will share the stories of the one who experienced our life in all its fullness. I will sing praises to you, O Lord, because you have dealt bountifully with me. Let us worship God. For today's opening hymn, we'll be singing, I Surrender All. Please join in as Ashley provides the music.
sense then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Righteous judge and benevolent ruler, hear us as we confess our sin. We are prone to punish those who offend us. We hasten to harm the image of those with whom we disagree. In the midst of diversity, we are quick to determine who shall be saved or condemned, while claiming that you alone discern all goodness and truth. Help us to hear again how Christ died to save all of humanity and hinder our efforts to decide who will enter your kingdom. And all God's people said, Amen. Paul writes, But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therein lies our assurance. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. It's the first Sunday of the month. I think you know what that means. Time for our five cents a meal offering. The theory is that for every meal you eat, you set aside a nickel as an offering to help those facing hunger. Of course, especially with inflation, a nickel doesn't buy much. So while we still call it five cents a meal, we hope you'll participate at whatever level you feel able. Half of our five cents a meal offering goes to Crisis Assistance Ministry here in Gastonia. Last Sunday at our in-person service, we read a letter of thanks from Cam for our contributions that were directed through the community foundations run back in April. Doing so resulted in matching dollars being added to our contributions. So thank you for your offering. The other half goes to the Presbytery of Western North Carolina to be used by its hunger committee, supporting programs throughout the region and beyond. Of course, in addition to that special offering, we want to thank you for your ongoing gifts, tithes, and offerings for the ministry and missions of this church. Now, let us dedicate all these gifts to the service of our Lord. Let us pray. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering over the wrecks of time. All the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. 
as we glory in the cross of Christ, O God. So we also seek to serve the cause for which he died. Accept the gifts placed before you as symbols of our commitment. May the light of your sacred story shine forth for all to see. Amen. Gospel reading for today comes to us from Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. Listen now to the word of our Lord. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly, I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Lord, Speak to Me is our hymn of preparation. You'll find the lyrics on your screen. Today's New Testament reading comes to us from Romans, chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. 
What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I must be cruel to be kind, says Shakespeare's Hamlet in Act Three of the famous play. I must be cruel to be kind. That is what we call an example of a paradox. Two contradictory ideas that common sense would tell you could never both be true, but somehow are, or at least could be. The Age of Enlightenment a period associated mostly with the 18th century, was a time of rapid development of science and philosophy. It was also known as the Age of Reason, when debates raged over monarchy versus liberty and freedom. It provided the intellectual structure behind the American Revolution. The arguments found in our Declaration of Independence were products of the Enlightenment. Yet, paradoxically, many of the men who championed freedom in those days also supported the institution of slavery. Today, in the 21st century, slavery is illegal throughout the world. Yet, by some estimates, about 40 million people, including children, are considered enslaved, forced to labor for other people under the threat of violence. Laws abolished slavery, and yet it thrives. That's a paradox. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Christians in Rome, provides the reader with lots of paradoxes. The laws handed down to Moses' people through Moses were designed to prevent sin, yet sin not only failed to abate, Paul wrote, it kind of got worse. For some people, knowing what was prohibited just made sin more desirable. Through Christ, the need for the law in many ways disappeared because of God's gift of grace. 
Christ's sacrifice was the only way the bridge between us and God could be repaired. So now we have freedom from sin. Or do we? As it turns out, what we have as a result of the cross is a choice. We can continue to live in sin, or we can choose to obey God's will. Either way, the paradox, according to Paul, is this. Each of us is still a slave. Here is an example of a paradox for you to consider. Are you ready? This sentence I'm speaking is a lie. Think about it. If I am indeed lying in that sentence, isn't the sentence actually true? How can that be? Well, that's a paradox. Now consider Paul's paradox. To be free from slavery necessarily entails being a slave. For the apostle, this is strictly a binary either or. Either you are a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. There's no gray area here. But it's important to note that Paul wants us to understand that even his explanation is not without limitations. The truth is that we mortals don't have the exact words to describe what Paul is attempting to tell us. So he uses the illustration of slavery, a context which his original readers would have most certainly understood in order to best describe the paradox of freedom in Christ. You are a slave to whomever you obey. Christ himself instructed us in his Sermon on the Mount, no one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. Again, a strict binary choice. No wiggle room. As we can all attest, the death of Jesus on the cross did not eliminate sin from the world. <laughs> it's still alive and kicking. But what changed with the cross and the resurrection was actually rather radical. Before, we had no choice but to be ruled by sin. After, we received the freedom to choose our master. When you confessed faith in God through Christ, part of what you were committing to was a life where you do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Although it might be tempting to limit this injunction from Paul to, you know, sexual related sins, Paul has no such limits. He's talking about every sin that we could commit with our brain, our heart, a fist, a foot, our tongue, etc., etc. The problem with sin is that it can just be so alluring in the moment. It feels good tastes good. It can even smell good. Eating rich ice cream all day, every day, sounds like an ideal life, doesn't it? I love ice cream. 
But what happens to your body if that's all you eat? And you are eating it all the time. The wages of your overindulgence will be obesity, most likely an early death, among other issues. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of, Paul wrote. Think of all that was wasted. I guess all of us have done things in our lives that we wish we could go back and undo. Things we said, choices we made. There's that word choice again. Sometimes it feels like we have no choices in life, but we really do. In the freedom gained on the cross, we can choose to obey God. Paul ends our passage with an interesting revelation. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When sin is our master, who benefits from that relationship? Yeah, certainly we get paid a wage, a pleasure, possessions, maybe even wealth. But rare is the employee who makes more than the employer. Sin takes from the sinner. Sin is an unforgiving master that wants to take ever more from its slave. Part of the pro-slavery argument by those who owned other people was that they took hapless people from an uncivilized place, gave them a home, a job, food and clothing. Wasn't that better than what they had? That ignores the fact that the master profited from their labors, not the people he or she owned. People who never were given a choice of being free or slave. They could work themselves to death, but to what end? A common grave on the edge of the master's land? Slaves to sin earn nothing but the emptiness of death at the end of their road. Now, contrast that to those who choose to become slaves to God and righteousness. The paradox is those who obey God do not earn wages. Whether you labor in the fields of righteousness for 12 hours a day or just one hour, at the end of the workday, you don't get paid. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? The sinner receives wages. Why doesn't the slave to righteousness? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When we choose to make God our master, when we take up the cross as Jesus instructed us, when we love one another and show that love in our actions as well as our words, when we live for Christ instead of for ourselves, we show our gratitude for God's free gift of grace. Grace that leads not to eternal death, but eternal life. What I find so miraculous is that we have an omnipotent God who not only allows us to choose between the two paths, but actively encourages us to take the path of righteousness. He wants us to make the right choice, but 
won't force us. That's freedom. I'm pretty sure you've heard the phrase, freedom isn't free, but probably not in this context. Choosing righteousness means choosing to work against our own sinful nature. Choosing God means challenging ourselves, not judging others or finding and decrying someone else's sin, but rather choosing to leave behind our own sin, asking forgiveness and repenting. There are only two roads to travel, two masters to obey. And you can choose only one or the other. There's no path down the middle. We are slaves, regardless of our picks. So today, our challenge for you on this 4th of July holiday weekend is simply this. Choose your master. If you don't choose, you in effect have made your choice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, let us turn our hearts and minds to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Master, this week, as people from one end to another of our country talks about freedom, remind us that you are the source of all true freedom. In you alone do we find ourselves, discovering your spirit deep within us, guiding us through our earthly life. Whenever you call us, give us the strength and the courage to cry out, here I am. We give you thanks for Christ Jesus, whose name we now bear through baptism. He went about teaching what it means to obey. He fulfilled your law as he served all those in need. By his death, he atoned for the sins of your people. He interceded for all as he was hung on a cross. But death could not keep him, and he lives now in our midst. We give you thanks for the Holy Spirit, who guides us today. The Spirit serves as assurance that you do not leave us alone. By the Spirit we are led to people in want confronted by thorny issues and prodded to enlarge our horizons. We give you thanks for the scripture that bears witness to your presence. Keep us mindful of, O oh God, of those who have gone before us and of the history in which we stand. Today, gracious Lord, we come to you with prayers Prayers on behalf of Barbara Plyler, for Beth Sanders. We give thanks for the recovery of Silva and continue our deepest prayers for Lee and for Susie. Continue to be with Marilyn and with Joyce Bell, with Penny and Moselle and her family. We pray for Rick and Nancy and for Mac for Darlene and for Pat Button. We pray for Vicki and Judy, for Lorraine Miller and for Jerry, for Sandra, for Adrian, Doug and Ashley, for Debbie and Bobby Olt. We pray for Kim and for Alan, for Ted and for Mitchell, for Bill and Martin, Becky and David. We continue our prayers for Brantley and for Tiffany and Michaela, for Greg Fail and for Johnny Frazier, for Kay and Lorraine, Bruce and Joyce, 
for Shirley and Linda, for Claudette and TC. We give our prayers for Ashley and our thanks for helping with Hamilton. We pray for Ray Palmer and Debbie Palmer, for Amber and Sherry, for Terry and Morgan, Barbara Moses and Henry, Gary, Jean Dutton, Nancy Denton, for Jane and for Eric. Sovereign God, ruler of all hearts, you call us to obey you and favor us with true freedom. Keep us faithful to the ways of your Son, that leaving behind all that hinders us, we may fix our eyes on him and steadfastly follow in the paths of your kingdom. Grant this through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever, and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us proclaim to the whole world what it is that we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is a favorite of some of you. Here I am, Lord, singing out loud.
have come to the end of another online worship service from Robinson Memorial. Thank you for joining us. If you found inspiration and fodder for your faith in today's service, please consider giving it a like or a thumbs up online. Leave a comment and also share the link with anyone and everyone. In just a few moments, you'll see on your screen the mailing address, website address, and a QR code, providing ways that you can help this ministry with your gifts. Thank you for your support. And remember, the big blue box is back, ready to receive donations of school supplies for the children and our next door neighbor, Robinson Elementary. Happy shopping. Have a safe Independence Day holiday, and we'll see you next Sunday right here. Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to the gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed. And through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.